Antonia Juhas, um, I want to bring you into this conversation, oil and energy investigative journalist Bertha Fellow, whose new article for Rolling Stone is headlined, Hurricane Ida Pounded Louisiana's Cancer Alley. Its residents need help and demand change. Uh, Antonia, you tweeted yesterday, I believe, the extent of damage done from the fossil fuel and petrochemical industry here, from leaks, spills, flaring, ruptures, chemicals, releases, et cetera, as a result of Hurricane Ida, may be ultimately um, among the worst first of such events ever recorded. Um, put this in context for us, as you head back home to New Orleans and the significance of uh, Sharon as an environmental leader leading the struggle uh, to challenge the fossil fuel industry that contaminates so much of the community that she and others are in. Yeah, and I want to say good morning to Sharon, um, especially as another storm is heading um, her way and our way and wishing her safety. Um, so, you know, basically, there's uh, several compounding, compounding problems happening right now. There isn't power to almost all of Cancer Alley, where Sharon lives. And some of the um, refineries and petrochemical facilities have power, but sort of shockingly, a lot of them don't. And because they don't, they are releasing um, uh, horrible flares, black, dirty flares. They've been flooded. They're releasing chemicals. They're um, spilling. And they're not expected to have power for another two weeks. So you have the impacts on the citizens, on Sharon and her community, of not having power, of not having assistance. And then you have this um, petrochemical and fossil fuel industry that might spend two weeks um, unable to repair itself. Uh, and so you have compounding problems on top of each other, and that's just the onshore problem. Offshore, there's a whole host of um, drill ships, platforms, uh, infrastructure that we know that's been damaged, but they they can't get out there. So the uh, Coast Guard has done flyovers, but the companies haven't gotten out there, so we still don't know the extent of the damage offshore. And part of that, again, is this power outage problem, which is still plaguing the state. That said, we already know of at least 350 report, reported spills in the Gulf and, and on land waters. I think the impacts are going to be, uh, as you read, devastating, continue to be devastating when it's all taken into account. And Antonia, can you talk about what has been um, Marathon's response after Sharon Levine's video documentation of that September 5th uh, oil spill? Um, yes, so Marathon uh, said to me that they noted that the spill had happened at that tank farm with the with the crude pouring over the, the edges, um, but that it hadn't contaminated air or water. But then I saw that they had actually filed with the State Department, uh, Department of Environmental Quality, that there was impacts to both um, water and land. So I think the full extent, again, of that damage is yet to be known because all we have right now is what Sharon is able to see with her eyes and report and what the company is telling us. And this is a problem throughout the state because the um, environmental regulator, the Department of Environmental Quality, is also having problems getting out. But also their air monitoring stations, 15 of them were out, out I assume for outage, by the refineries, by the petrochemical plants to monitor that's just the air quality aren't there. So the, the access to information is extremely limited, also because of the ongoing storm damage, just making it difficult to get to get to areas. You even have Shell, Antonia, but, an offshore oil site, um, also, preventing uh, not picking up 100 of their offshore oil workers on the platform as the storm hit. They were stranded there? Yeah. So. You, there's two um, platforms. One, a shell drill ship. Yes, they they left 100 workers in the island platform, which is entirely bizarre because generally evacuating workers from offshore platforms is standard procedure. We know from the videos that these uh, workers were, were media that the ship took on extensive water. We know that it had to lose some of its equipment into the onto the ocean floor. They were evacuated. They finally are moving that rig off to Mississippi. They were, they've been out on the water since the storm. Um, and um, that's only one of Shell's platforms. Another one, one of their 
facilities that takes on 200,000 barrels of oil a day and uh, natural gas a day, it's a transit hub, has also uh, been damaged during the storm. And we don't know the extent of the, extent of the damage. There's oil sheets in the water from another drill ship. Um, the commodities markets are already reporting that this is the worst harm to the oil sector from uh, in the Gulf Coast since at least 2005 with the combination of Katrina and Rita. And I think, again, that's a sign that what we're going to start seeing is because of the extent of the, the period of damage, not having uh, electricity, the winds, the high winds, that we're going to see um, more and more evidence of extensive spills, releases, ruptures, damages onshore, offshore, which we're already seeing. Uh, and uh, and Sharon, Sharon, I, I'd like to ask you what uh, uh, those who argue that the petrochemical industry is vital to jobs uh, in Louisiana. Uh, what's your response uh, uh, to them, especially in, uh, after crises like this? My response is: What's more important, a human life or job? It's not that we are against industry, against industry that's trying to harm us, take our health, and take our lives. We want to live. We want to breathe clean air. These industries are not allowing us to breathe clean air or drink clean water. And finally, Antonia, Entergy. I remember seeing all the Entergy vans uh, after Hurricane Katrina. Now, a million customers lost power um, uh, after Ida, um, still hundreds of thousands in darkness, no electricity. The private company and what should be done about it? Yeah, so only about 50 percent of Louisiana has, that lost power has had its power restored. All of the lower-lying areas where Sharon is located um, the southeast of the state are uh, almost still without power and are expected to be for two weeks. Um, you know, basically what folks are talking about here is that the problem with energy is that it is a highly centralized fossil fuel intensive um, electricity company. Coal, natural gas in particular are its baselines. And that what needs to happen is a decentralized community based renewable energy system where you've got power provided closer to the and within control of the consumer, that it can be separated out. So if you lose power up here, you still have power everywhere else. And that power is helping to mitigate the climate crisis, not contribute to it through coal, natural gas. Mm. Um, an alliance for affordable energy analysis compared New Orleans to the nation and Louisiana as a whole and found the city not only has excessively high durations and frequency of power outages, but that they're also unequal. Gentilly, New Orleans East, Lower Ninth Ward, neighborhoods which are majority people of color and low income experience the greatest proportion of outages, demonstrating a clear form of environmental racism. The analysis says New Orleans also has the second highest percentage of household income spent on energy bills in the country. That reading from Antonia's National Geographic article. We want to thank you both for being with us. We'll continue to report on what's happened in the Gulf. Antonia Yuhas, oil and energy investigative journalist, Sharon Levine, founder and director of RISE St. James in Louisiana, recipient of the 2021 Goldman Environmental Prize, known as the Green Nobel Peace Prize. Um, Sharon, stay safe. And uh, good luck, Antonia, as you head back home to New Orleans. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, the Nobel Prize-winning economist Joe Stiglitz on unemployment um, benefits ending on Labor Day, on vaccine inequity, and the Federal Reserve Board, why AOC and others are demanding the replacement of Jerome Powell. Stay with us.